happen. So Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to read the first five verses together. And I will remind you while I'm doing this, uh, if you have your cell phone with you today, you might want to silence it so we don't embarrass you in the middle of a sermon. Um, and if you have, uh, and I found out too, I got one of those super duper watches that also wants to talk to my cell phone. And it also makes noise. So I had to silence it this morning as well. So silence your phones and silence your watches if they're one of those. Galatians 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in him, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another for each one shall bear his own load and father we thank you for your word and we thank you that each word in your word speaks to us so as we dive in this morning to uh, a time in your word and we seek to learn from you that we would learn things that are useful for eternity and we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus name amen well, anybody know what today is? Day. It's May Day. So you people remember that. Wow, it's amazing. Do you know that May Day has really old beginnings? It actually began during the what were called the Early Middle Ages. The Early Middle Ages had another name. They were called the Dark Ages. So you guys are historians. So I'm not going to teach you anything this morning. Some of you come up here and t- teach me, will you? So... May 1st is traditional May Day, so that's where we are today, and it originated as a Celtic celebration or tradition that was called Beltane or Bell Fire, and it um, was a celebration of the change of seasons, and it was also a celebration of new birth, and it was, um, well, let me just go back to the Dark Ages for a moment, because when you, th- you think about the Dark Ages, what do you think about darkness, right? And no advancement, no gains, no nothing. But in fact, there was a lot of cultural advancement during that period. It just wasn't wasn't looked at so much. And there was a lot of increase in Christian ministry, ministries around the world during the dark ages. So when there is dark, what happens? The light shines more brightly, doesn't it? So Bel, or from this Beltane, was a Celtic god. Isn't it interesting how we tend to pick gods from places that don't don't make any sense to us to to pay our attention to? Bel was a god, and Beltane meant bell fire. And so it was a celebration that included fire, as you might guess. It was a festive celebration at least, but was more likely pretty bawdy. And it included a lot of different things, including bonfires. And I've been to one of these, but it was a midsummer celebration in Sweden. They did pretty much the same thing because summer doesn't come until middle of summer in Sweden, and it goes away about the next day. So um, they had the same kinds of things. So it included bonfires and a maypole. Now, how many of you marched around or, or danced around the maypole as a child with the streamers and all that stuff? So it was kind of cute, wasn't it? Well, the maypole is a fertility symbol. I would say no more. And I look back at that and I think, oh my goodness. What a horrible thing we did as children. We didn't know any better. And so uh, I, I don't recommend the maypole. And as a matter of fact, the church rejected this celebration in uh, 1645, Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans ended it, and they stated that it was, and this is a quote, heathenish vanity generally abused to superstition and wickedness. So it, it ceased to exist at that point in time. Well, today we have a May Day that looks at a different 
aspect of life, and that's the labor part, labor, uh, laboring people. And when you look at that, it began in 1884. Now, none of us were around at that point in time, so we have to trust our history books to know that this is true. You know that the children today don't trust any books? They don't trust anybody over 30. They don't trust this book. But we need to trust this book and some portions of history anyway. This has been pretty well documented that during the Industrial Revolution, a major labor union, which was a predecessor of the AFL, actually decided that they should do something, and that was to proclaim that, again, a quote, eight hours shall constitute a legal day's labor from and after May 1st, 1886. So two, day, two years later, they were going to have a regulated workday of eight hours only. It was to counter poor working conditions that were resulting in the deaths of many men, women, and children who were in the workforce at that time. So on May 1st, 1886, there was a workers' strike because it hadn't actually happened yet. The, the business owners weren't ready to do that. So there was a workers' strike that lasted for several days. And it ended up in a, started peacefully, but it ended up in a conflict. Do you anybody remember what that was called? The Haymarket Rebellion. And I remember that term from the history books, but I don't remember it personally either. Praise God, I'm not quite that old. And there was also national unrest because it was, it was considered to be a, a national problem. So today, May 1st is known as Workers' Day. And it was actually started in the U.S. And yet we don't celebrate it here today. It was adopted by many governments worldwide. And some of those governments were socialistic and some were communistic. And as a result, the American government decided it probably wasn't a good thing to stay associated with that date for that cause. So U.S. President Grover Cleveland, again, I don't remember him personally, officially moved that, that Labor Day be changed to what? The first Monday in September. So that's why we have the first Monday in September today. So... There you go. That's, that's May Day. We can go home. We're done <laughs> with that piece of history, that is. So we, you're still singing, thinking, where's this guy going? <laughs> and my greatest fear is you'll remember what I've just told you and you won't remember what's coming because it's more, what's coming is more important. So all that cultural and labor history aside, we need to drive towards something more useful today. And not even associated with with May Day culture or the labor movement. The term is used to designate distress and it sounds similar. It is May Day, May Day. And it doesn't come from the same source. It was coined in 1923 by an airport radio officer in London, England. His name was Frederick Mockford. And it was an English transliteration of a French term. Meder, meder. And I'm not sure I'm not pronouncing it right because I don't know French well at all. But it sounds like May Day. And so it was adapted by the English. And it means, come and help me. Come and help me. So that's where we're going to be today. We're going to talk about helping so come and help me. Jesus tells his disciples and us that he will send another helper. And this is one of his parting phrases, and he does this, and it's recorded in John chapter 14, verse 16. He says that the helper is coming. This helper is the Holy Spirit. And he was given on Pentecost shortly after Jesus ascended to heaven. Now, Jesus did not send the Holy Spirit just to save us when all else fails. Unfortunately, that's how a lot of people look at life today. Actually, he was sent to be with believers all the time, to live within them, to live within us. And if we wait for trouble to begin, 
assess our own ability to tackle it, and then think about invoking the help of the Holy Spirit, we've missed the most important characteristic of the helper. He is with us all the time. We need to involve him all the time. His input should be included long before trouble happens. Help from the Holy Spirit is not intended for just when all else fails. Although, he still wants us to call on him in times of trouble. Now, God expects us to ask for help. Dwight Moody said, Some people think God does not like to be troubled with our constant coming and asking. The way to trouble God is not to come to him at all. So our sources for help today are God and others. The Word, the Bible, tells us to love God and to love others. This tells us who our support groups are, God above and man below. So we'll talk about asking God for help for a while, and we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7, if you'd like to turn there. Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. This is a very well-known set of verses. Many people use them correctly. Many people use them incorrectly. So we're going to talk today about their application to our lives. Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. Many people use these verses to build and communicate expectations that God must, must meet all of our wants. It doesn't say that, but humans want it to say that, forgetting that God knows what is best for us. And he has an eternal view not limited by our short-term desires. Jesus' message continued from prior verses when we get here into chapter 7. He was talking about food, drink, and clothing in chapter 6. And it was highlighted by verses 33 and 34, which again, very well known. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. It doesn't say that all your desires will be satisfied but that your basic needs will be met according to his will. And that according to his will is not, not explicit here. It's implicit. You know what that means? It means it's there, it's included, it's intended, but it's not stated, which is unfortunate, I think, sometimes. I wish it was in there, but it's not. That's the way God wanted it to be said. So verse 7 begins by saying, Ask, and it will be given unto you implied if God wills it. We have direct access to God because of Jesus' sacrifice and our acceptance of it, and that makes it happen. God always hears when we ask, always hears when we ask, whether we ask for a necessity or we ask for a Cadillac. He hears. He answers. Sometimes the answer is yes, Sometimes the answer is no, and sometimes the answer is later. This is so different from the other gods of this world that do not have ears and do not hear and cannot answer. Our God not only hears our requests, but he answers our requests. And we need to listen carefully sometimes for those answers. So I think it's important we keep that in mind. So how we ask is to pray to God. That's, that's our, our, our mode, our method, our technique, is to pray to him. The request might be accompanied with praise as well, and it should be. So when you're praying to God, praise him, and then ask for what it is you need to ask for. We might ask for ourselves, or we might ask for others. Praying for those on a prayer list is it one way we ask God for help. And we've done that this morning. And hopefully you take those prayer lists and you, you use them at home. They don't just end up in the trash at the end of church today. But you use them as a way to recognize that there are needs and we can be praying for them. We think that God's response needs to fulfill our expectations. 
but it is more importantly setting up a situation where Jesus is glorified. Believers are encouraged in their walk, and non-believers are drawn to a personal relationship with the eternal God. So this idea of asking goes on in verse 8. I'm going to be going back and forth between 7 and 8 here a little bit. So verse 8 says, Everyone who asks receives. But it depends on the eternal purpose of the request. You know, the fish and serpent example that's given here is one that I think of often. It should be a good metric for us. We don't always ask for what is good for us or for the church. We request the serpent. And God knows it is not a good request to be given. So he answers, no, I'm not going to give you a serpent. That's dangerous for you. You shouldn't be asking for that. So we might ponder, why didn't God heal my baby daughter? Hard one. We can't presume we understand what God knows and holds as best for us or for the church. We might be deeply hurt by what seems to be God's silence or his lack of response. But he always knows what is best, and our view is humanly limited. He is God, and we are not. Back to verse 7. Seek, and you will find, if God wills it. The image here is not just saying a request, but also looking for it, digging deeper, going deeper. It's an extension of ask, and it implies more earnest imploring, requesting. The explanation is the same. Even if you seek, the response is based on God's knowledge and eternal purpose. Notice that we are encouraged to plead without reservation for satisfaction. He doesn't tell us not to pray for our wants. He just says you need to expect that God will give you your needs, not necessarily your wants. Remember that God's response is what he knows is the right answer and not what we think is the right answer. Back to verse 8, the same idea. And he who seeks finds. It means that God's will is a key factor. It's a terrible thing to be out of the will of God. So don't wish for the terrible. You don't want to be in the terrible. Verse 7 again, knock and it will be opened unto you. This takes the process to the next level. Ask, seek, knock. It's not just talking the request or seeking the answer, but now standing at the door, demanding not to be ignored. This would be fervent prayer, passionately offered, and most likely of the greatest importance to the requester. The Bible does say that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or person avails much, and that's recorded in James chapter 5, verse 16. It doesn't change God's will, but it will get God's attention. So we need to be praying effectual, fervent prayers. Verse 8, And to him who knocks, it will be opened. So you have his attention, and you will get his answer. So accept his answer, even if it is not according to your will. Come back again to... We don't always discern God's will. I don't know about you. Maybe you always do. I don't always discern God's will. I pray for things that I think are right, but it's, it's God, in God's hands. He knows what the real right response is. And then in verse 9 and 10, he says, Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, you will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, you will give him a serpent? We just looked at this a little bit earlier. And we need to be aware that God wants the best for eternity. And sometimes that may not mean the best for the individual in this lifetime. And if we ask wrongly, he will not grant the request, but will give us according to his will and what we need rather than what we want. Verse 11, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him. Notice that in this passage, it uses the word children and not child. 
So he's speaking about everyone. It's not just one person here. He considers all the children, past children, present children, future children. We don't give to one child at the detriment of another, or at least that's what a good parent would do. I'm not so sure about what an evil parent would do. It's hard to imagine. So how do we approach God for help? First of all, we need to recognize who he is. And as we do that, uh, Psalms 121 verse 2 says, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He's the creator, not only just the creator, but he's also the sustainer. He's with us today. He has an impact on lives today. Secondly, be humble and repent. As stated in 2 Chronicles 7.14, another familiar verse again that says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So we need to be humble and repent. And thirdly, be certain that you love God and you are diligent in your appeal. Proverbs 8.17 says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. So we need to be looking for God. And what, should, what should we ask him for? It's another area that's interesting to me because when even when we can't clearly discern God's will, say you have a decision to make about where to live, like this one lady who was mentioned this morning who's deciding to move off out of the area. Most of us would say, well, why would anybody do that? <clears throat> but... I pray it's God's will that that would be happening for her. So when we look at it today, there are some things that are very clear that are God's will for us. And in his word, it says in James 1, 5, that if you lack, if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives all, to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So all we need to do is ask for wisdom and it will be given. That's his will for us. So we need to pray for wisdom. Psalms 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. God will deliver us from our fears if we ask him. Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness and humility. So it is right for us to seek righteousness and humility from God. So we need to seek wisdom, deliverance, righteousness, and humility. So that covers asking God. I'm not sure I've covered it uh, well. I know I haven't co covered it completely, but it's enough to make us think about it and research the word and find what we need to be doing in that respect. But how about asking people for help? Well, let's look again at our text, which is Galatians 6, verses 1 and I'm just going to look now at verses 1 and 2. But Paul, just before this, in chapter 5, has listed the characteristics of one who walks in the Spirit and not in the flesh. We call them the fruit of the Spirit. Very common. Many people have those memorized. So in here, the items listed are ways to think, speak, and act godly and righteously. And they're in verses 22 through 25. In verse 26, he warns us not to become prideful because one of us is more mature than another. We're all growing at our own rates. So chapter 6 begins a new thought about helping one another. But it's not difficult to see how walking in the Spirit ties into exercising at least some of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, kindness, goodness, and gentleness are on that list. And they are important for us to exercise when we're looking for help or we're giving help. So verse 1 says, again, Brethren, if a man is overtaken by in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you be tempted. It tells us to help the errant one recognize his sin, confess his sin, and repent from his sin. The help is to be offered gently and not as a harsh master. Now, for most of us, giving help is a whole lot easier than asking for help. When you sense that someone has been overtaken in a sin, 
We need to offer help. They are less likely to come to you for help. Watch that the line that is drawn between caring and judging is observed. Our job is to care. It is not to judge. That should lead to a conversation that draws up someone towards righteousness rather than dragging them down there. Important characteristic that we need to experience and use. Verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That law is to love God and one another. It's recorded in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. And one another in this application includes neighbors, friends, enemies, and even family. Now, regarding someone who lacks things in life that they feel make it difficult, we should encourage them. Sometimes that encouragement will be reassurance, reassurance or even provision. Other times, it will be a godly warning or providing a scriptural message, rebuking certain behaviors or lifestyle choices. It's not always positive. Now, even for those who often seek assistance, it is important for us helpers to remain carers. That's a new word. Carers rather than judges. Look at them as someone who has a need rather than someone who is needy. Okay. Now, in the Bible, even kings are recorded as needing help. In 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, states that the king, then king Rehoboam, consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he lived and said, how do you advise me to answer the people? Now, Rehoboam was not a good example of a Christian. He wasn't a Christian for one thing. Christ hadn't come around yet, right? But Rehoboam was asking for the wrong reasons, and he didn't accept the advice of Solomon's counsel. He accepted the advice of his buddies, and he made things even worse for the people. But he needed help, and he asked for help. That's the key message here. We need to give help lovingly. In Galatians 5.13, says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. We need to learn, serve one another in love. Now, we are to serve by using what God has given us. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, As each one has received a gift, Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So, it is hard to ask for help, isn't it? I mean, if you're not, if you're not accustomed to asking for help, it is a difficult thing to do. Yeah, I, it's okay, I can do it myself. And we stumble through. And I think men are probably more like, what I'm describing than women. I don't know. Women may be more able to ask for help in general, you know, stereotypically. But I think it's, it's a hard thing. Why is it hard to ask for help? It's pride, isn't it? Yeah. So it's a pride that holds us down or keeps us back. But asking for help is biblical. It's something that we need to consider doing in our own lives. So needing help has always been part of God's design. In Genesis 2.18, it's recorded that the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. You know these verses, don't you? I will make him a helper comparable to him. And he's speaking about woman in this case. But we don't know how Adam and Eve split up the chores, but they were to complement each other. They were to be helpers to each other. Can you imagine the, the conversation? Hey, Eve, what do you think we should call this first animal with Four legs and a long nose and an appetite for ants. Aardvark. It has two A's at the beginning. That's the first animal. You want to name. Oh, okay. All right. So asking for help is a blessing to others. That's the second reason why we need to ask for help. It blesses other people. Paul writes to Galatians in, in the verses that we've just read that, um, again, I'll read them. Brethren. If a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one 
in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Serving others is a great joy. You are designed to want to help others. That's part of our design. We want to help others. Thirdly, asking for help acknowledges the truth of our need and God's grace. We have needs that we cannot personally or individually fulfill, and God's grace cannot be exhausted. Let me, let me say that again. We have needs that we cannot fulfill, and God has grace that cannot be exhausted. What a combination. Many times God uses people to meet our needs. Well, with all of that in mind, and to bring things together, first of all, we need to establish a life pattern that includes the Holy Spirit in planning and carrying out the plan. Before you do anything, pray. Do you know when the kings in the Bible were successful? It was when they prayed first and got God's direction. And when they failed, it's when they went to battle and then said, oops. Secondly, if things go wrong, don't hesitate to ask God for help. Thirdly, if the task is too big for you, ask others for help. Fourth, if someone asks you for help, help with a joyous heart. Fifth, individuals are part of the body of Christ, meaning that we have to be part of satisfying the needs of the body, not just ourselves. So we are a, we are a body. We're a part of the, the real, true, whole body of Christ. But we are a body. We need to be uh, functioning in each other's lives. And then sixth, helping outside the body demonstrates God's love to those who are yet his enemies and can draw them to salvation and eternal life. Now, we do this with a food closet here for one of the things that, that uh, we do to reach out outside the body. Some of those people who come to the food closet are believers. Many are not. Many of them a lot of life struggles and need a lot of help. Mayday. Mayday. The idea is to turn to God as a, and as appropriate to others when we need help. Situations do occur when an individual cannot do everything on their own. That's true even when we've planned well and walked faithfully with God. Life happens. Seek him and you will find him. Ask others if it makes sense to do so. And if you are the person, ask help if it is within your gifts to do so. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, um, I'm grateful for this little study. I know it, it opened some things up to me to understand. And I pray, God, that you would just continue to encourage us to walk with you, to work as the body of Christ, uh, serving one another, asking for help when help is needed, and always coming to you and including you in all of our plans and all that we do. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.